And here's the thing that people need to keep in mind. Everything is under a time constraint. Uh, American aid is not arriving in time. It may arrive or it may not arrive. Who knows what will arrive? But whatever has been committed ostensibly in the passage of the 61 billion doesn't have the time, there's not sufficient time to have it arrive uh, at the front in a way that will make a difference given the disparity of the forces that are there on the ground right now favoring Russia. Uh, the same is true for artillery. The same is true for drones. The same is true for manpower. All of these things are projected on behalf of Ukraine as assistance if Ukraine survives the year. But that's a big if. Hello, everybody. This is Pascal from Neutrality Studies. And today I'm again joined by Nikolai Petro, who's a professor of political science at the University of Rhode Island and the author of The Tragedy of Ukraine, What Classical Greek Tragedy Can Teach Us About Conflict. Nikolai has ties to both Russia and Ukraine and has been analyzing their internal political developments for decades. Today we want to do an update on the political developments in both countries and talk about the foreign affairs article by Sam Samuel Charap and Sergei Rachenko that a few weeks ago contributed another puzzle in the another piece in the puzzle uh, to the question about the failed Istanbul peace process back in 2022 and maybe give some clues toward uh, what a realistic peace process still could look like today. Nikolai, welcome back. Nice to be with you again. Um, Nikolai, we've recently seen Right now, we're seeing changes in the new cabinet of uh, Russia because the uh, Russian president Vladimir Putin's next term has begun um, and he, he reconstituted the cabinet. Um, what is your impression of this, of the new composition? The, the former defense minister, Mr. Shoigu, was transferred to uh, the security uh, um what is it called? Sorry, the, the Security Cabinet, um, the Security uh, yeah. Council. Yeah. And and we have a new <clears throat> defense minister and a couple of other people changed. How, did this surprise you or are this or is this something that, that you expected? No, I didn't expect it, but it's not surprising. Everybody, there has to be a rotation at some point. If you take President Putin at his word, then um, he's looking for fresh ideas, uh, new people who can manage things in a different way. Obviously, people like Shoigu, Shoigu Patrushev <clears throat> um, have a way of doing things, and uh, that preceded the uh, military uh, intervention, and they've had to adapt. So I would assume that in the course of the last three years, as new problems have surfaced logistically, administratively, it has become clear <clears throat> to senior officials who is doing a better job at uh, adapting to new circumstances, and coming up with uh, solutions to problems. Russia has been very good at dealing with <clears throat> the financial difficulties, for example. <clears throat> that was an, a totally uncharted area. Um, it seems they're also doing unexpectedly well, at least from a Western perspective, in <clears throat> supplying, <clears throat> I should say, obtaining uh, for themselves and producing uh, munitions and weaponry. So that had to come from somebody. I don't know who specifically, but uh, clearly it would be someone who was in charge of that process or someone on the staff who had these ideas. Uh, no one could have predicted and no one did predict the specific nominations, but uh, one uh, can reasonably assume 
that the people who are now emerging uh, contributed to uh, the success that we are seeing to date of uh, Russian preparedness for the conflict, its ability to deal with sanctions, and uh, <clears throat> the success we see uh, on, on the battlefield uh, right now. Mm, so uh, I guess uh, the, the, the changes at the top <clears throat> will then be accompanied by new people coming in at mid-level and lower levels as well. I mean, when people transfer, especially in, in tightly organized and centralized political systems, like the former Soviet system, like, like we have in Ukraine and, and in Russia, in Belarus, they tend to move in cohorts. So there's the so-and-so's team now moves into place, and, and the people associated with the previous manager's team get reshuffled and, and move somewhere else. So I think that's what, what we're seeing. Um, <clears throat> it's interesting that these moves are being made now because some people are looking at the developments uh, near Kharkov, north of Kharkov, uh, and saying, oh, there's a, there's a, a, a new offensive. There's a northern offensive underway. If that were true this would be an unusual move because an old russian saying has it you don't change course you don't change horses midstream in other words it's we're right in the middle of an offensive why would you change manage managers and managerial styles right now so either <clears throat> uh this is not the main offensive and that's still being prepared and I assume would be underway when everything uh, is is more or less settled in terms of uh, the administrative apparatus, or uh, this transition has been underway for much longer and has already been planned and thought out, and now this is simply the icing on the cake. There's arguments for both sides. Maybe the latter makes sense because, you know, it, it is rare in any administration. You wouldn't expect this of an American administration, for example, <clears throat> to be able to come up with a host of new names within days, literally within days of uh, the inauguration. Uh, there would be there'd be too much political infighting. So maybe the team, uh, if we think of Putin's team as being the ones managing the system overall, maybe it's broader than we think and is better connected than we think. And so it would then be a more formidable opponent because replacing one person or another person wouldn't really undermine its ability to conduct policy. It, it would be a, a deeper political system than most people in the West give it credit for. Yeah, I mean, the 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 most superficial of the superficial, of course, uh, have the idea that Vladimir Putin manages everything, and if he no. was just gone, then entire Russia will collapse and so on. But we yeah. know that that is dumb. But even we right. are learning at the moment that there are even more key figures in in lower levels that we might not have seen before and that are now coming coming out. Uh, the question I would have about the Ministry of Defense is, so the, the, the top position is actually mostly, mostly um, staffed by a civilian. I mean, Mr. Shoigu was a civilian and the new yeah. guy coming in, I forgot his name, is also a civilian. He's a uh, uh, He's more of a, man a, a manager, actually. Um, yeah. And below the military seems to be everything seems to be in place as before, which contrasts very strongly with what yeah. happened in Ukraine two, three months ago when when the the, the, the top general uh, Solujny was 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 uh, replaced. replaced right? by Sus, yeah, but but and those those changes are continuing uh, at um, the level of regional commanders and things like those. Those people are being shaken up. Um, 
<clears throat> it does seem quite a bit more disorganized in Ukraine. Um, <clears throat> um, one reason for this is that they seem to lack the depth of senior staff. Or, or maybe they have enough senior staff, but the problem really is beco becomes when you're when you have to deploy forces on the ground, we're hearing an endless number of reports now from Western sources, a lot of British newspapers. El País had an article uh, in the last few days as well, the Spanish newspaper. <clears throat> a lot of reports uh, about uh, commanders locally disobeying orders or not being able to fulfill orders or simply interpreting them in different ways because they think they know better on the ground and they don't have the staff there's nothing that <coughs> logistically uh, the um, a central command is able to provide them that would give them confidence in the outcome the interesting uh, remarks i've been hearing recently or reading recently about the situation uh, in this in the um, villages uh, north of Kharkov, where there was no defense set up, and they were entirely caught by surprise, and the Russians just walked in, as one of the local commanders said, when millions of hryvnia have been allocated for a defensive structure, were allocated last year for a defensive structure to be built. So this is a, another corruption scandal. Now I should point out that one of the things that attached to Shoigu also was recently a corruption scandal with one of his close associates who is under investigation. So that may have played a role, although I don't know how much of a role, but in Ukraine, such reports, again, are uh, without number anymore. And uh, they always seem to be to come up when there is some failure or potential breakthrough uh, at the front. And this is particularly unfortunate for Ukraine because it undermines, there's not only the problem of actually having sufficient forces on the ground and, and having the resources, there's also the problem of demoralization in the ranks, uh, where people are now beginning to question whether the, the, the capacity of the Ukrainian armed forces to resist. No one doubts the individual heroism of uh, troops but as an organized military force, there are a, a lot of questions that seem to be raised increasingly in the Ukrainian press. By that, I mean basically blogs and, and uh, things that are outside the purview of uh, the state-mandated state mandated press, state-controlled press. Um, and uh, there's a lot of criticism there. And of course, uh, this is also leaking through to Western press accounts. The, the one thing that struck me about Mr. Putin's interview with Mr. Carlson was that even Mr. Putin seemed to allude to the uh, heroism of the Ukrainians, like uh, basically lauding them as Russians, but basically saying <laughs> they, they, they don't stop fighting. Uh, yeah. But that's why it is such a tragedy, as you point out in your book, that these two systems are, are set against each other. And, and um, if I was a local commander in Ukraine, I would definitely have like very high incentive to disobey orders if I knew that that I, there, there's things planned mm -hmm. that would lead to, uh, to, to an impossibility on the ground, because we're seeing it's not enough yeah. people, right? So, well, yeah. yeah. And, and that's one of the scary... Well, not scary, but worrying thing. When you are an analyst and you're trying to understand what's happening, you uh, tend to focus on details. How many people 
are there? How many weapons are being deployed? What is the actual <clears throat> figure of the resources that are going to be spent over what time? All of these are data points that you can use to, from which to extrapolate. You, you know, it's not helpful particularly to have some analyst or some professor like myself say, to summarize all this and interpret interpret it for you <clears throat> because you don't know what information I have or don't have. So if you want to really have an informed analysis, you try to find as much concrete information as you can. Even if it's contradictory, you can at least say, well, one side says this, one side says that. Those are parameters. Those are our bookends, if you will. And then uh, you can <clears throat> estimate which of those uh, interpretations uh, is closer to reality. One of the things I've noticed is the complete absence of any indication in any published sources that I've been able to find of precisely how many people the uh, ongoing mobilization for, you, uh, uh, for Ukraine is anticipated to yield. In other words, how many people they actually expect to be on the front after <clears throat> a few weeks or months of training as a result of this extra mobilization, <clears throat> which is, I gather, the last mobilization that they'll be able um, to accomplish, given that, well, within the parameters that we have, having having changed the age now uh, to to include a broader pool of people. So we don't we do, we don't have that number. Uh, we don't have any anticipated number. We don't have even a potential number from which to extrapolate what uh, how many people might actually wind up at the front. So you have the most wide ranging and bizarre interpretation. I read um, a Mr. Uh, Wat Watkins, I believe, in Foreign Affairs. He's at the Royal um, Institute uh, for Strategic Studies. And he's, he simply blithely states that uh, it's not true that there's a manpower shortage in Ukraine. There are, he says, millions of potential uh, people who, who could fight. Uh, which is very surprising because even if you look at a demographic chart, the number barely reaches half a million. If one adds in the new age cohort from 25 to 27, who have been added to the existing pool, I don't imagine there's much more to be squeezed from the existing pool because they've been fighting for three years. And if they haven't already left the country, they found other ways to hide or to avoid being drafted. So they, this is something they have, they're well practiced at, the existing cohort. And the amount that could be added to that, actually new recruits, is I think around possibly 500,000. That's, that's just counting everyone that it could be possibly counted. The problem is, however, you could only reach the millions if you included uh, the 10 million or so Ukrainians who are in Western Europe as refugees, essentially. Um, but they clearly don't want to go back. And, and no one argues that they have any interest in going back or uh, have any desire uh, to, 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 to join this fight. So... Uh, the expectation that a large number of people will be mobilized as a result of uh, this uh, expansion of, of the potential cohort strikes me as, as a fantasy that should, should not be entertained by anybody knowledgeable. But we have seen that about uh, two weeks ago or so, there was there were these reports <laughs> that, I mean, Ukraine now does not... Uh, give consular uh, support anymore to uh, male Ukrainian nationals abroad in fighting age. 
uh, they will not renew their passports. And there was this whole thing on on Twitter right. where like Ukrainian officials said, if you don't want to serve your country, then you're so, you cannot expect your country to serve yes. you. I don't even know if that is illegal under international law. And we see the Estonian foreign minister who said uh, we should send them back. And in, like really we horrible do. things. I like I, I but, can't believe it. But, <laughs> well, as as and it is at this point inconceivable that the EU would take a decision to forcibly deport people into a war zone. That Where they will be forced happened. to fight against their will, obviously. Yeah, uh, well, into a danger, into, into a zone where they would be clearly at risk for their lives. That, that would violate every core principle of the EU. I'm not saying it's impossible, uh, given what we've seen, but it would be uh, a radical departure. And we, we, while, as you point out, the Polish, I think, deputy minister and uh, some official in the Estonian government has said that they would like to encourage uh, Ukrainians to go back, which can be done in a variety of ways that you can sort of withdraw support from them locally, you know, not uh, take away their financial assistance and things like that in the host country, and then sort of force them uh, to to flee uh, from there. I don't think they would necessarily go back to Ukraine. I think that would be their last choice. They would, they, they, they might go to a variety of other countries that would be more welcoming. And Hungary has already said it will not <clears throat> deport anyone who doesn't want to go, uh, who is from Ukraine. And and as I understand the current EU thinking, it is that some sort of um, uh, uh, block-wide uh, policy will have to be decided. And if that's the case, we know that Slovakia, Hungary, <coughs> maybe now Croatia as well, other countries um, will insist that um, humanitarian concerns take precedence over uh, the desire to send uh, more Ukrainians back to die at the front. Um, because it would be just, um, as I said, an unconscionable violation of, of EU human rights laws. Uh, so I think we're quite a ways from having any any uh, systematic policy in that regard. And here's the thing that people need to keep in mind. Everything is under a time constraint. Uh, American aid is not arriving in time. It may arrive or it may not arrive. Who knows what will arrive? But whatever has been committed ostensibly in the passage of the 61 billion doesn't have the time there's not sufficient time to have it arrive uh, at the front in a way that will make a difference given the disparity of the forces that are there on the ground right now favoring Russia. Uh, the same is true for artillery. The same is true for drones. The same is true for manpower. All of these things are projected on behalf of Ukraine as assistance if Ukraine survives the year. But that's a big if. And the arguments that I've seen recently by Victoria Newland and uh, Yale history professor Timothy Sh uh, Snyder <clears throat> are particularly weak and empty on the issue of how Ukraine is supposed to to survive its lack of resources in all areas, including manpower, for the next six months. Instead, everything is like, well, we've made a commitment. We know they're courageous. They'll hold on. And once they hold on past the six months, it will all begin to flow the, the resources they need. And then, and then we will uh, somehow organize a counteroffensive based on these new resources. But it's extremely unlikely that the situation, the facts on the ground, uh, will be the same 
uh, in six months that they are now. Right, but it, it, this is absolutely, I think, reasonable. Um, what you're saying, I what I wonder though is, um, you 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 talked about what's important when you do political analysis, and one more thing uh, besides like getting getting the details and the parameters right is to actually also look at the strategic goals, which is something that especially in the West, nobody seems to be doing seriously, at least not in, in, in public discourse in a lot of in, in a lot of the media, because the Russians have made it very clear. And people like uh, Alexander Mercurius and so on under the RAND, they, they analyzed this correctly, in my view, that the Russians have said they are not about land. The land is not the issue. In the East, it is. I and mean, for eight years, uh, Russia didn't want the Donbas republics inside Russia. They changed that strategy. It has to be part of Russia. That 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 is clear. But the West of Ukraine is not a strategic goal to actually uh, incorporate into Russia or to rule themselves. Right. They said so right. several times again. So the strategic <clears throat> goal is to make sure that Ukraine does not become a bulwark against Russia and that it doesn't pose a threat. So they have been had as having a strategy of wearing down the Ukrainian. Uh, right. forces and NATO, uh, everything NATO gives to them, right? They've been destroying right. NATO right. equipment. The uh, one thing I would add to that is that, and I and I tend to see the um, positional advances of Russian forces that we've seen so far in this light, um, beyond uh, the territorial boundaries of the four regions that uh, are now under mostly under Russian control. Once that territorial boundary is met, I think what Russia is now aiming to uh, create is a buffer zone. Yeah. The buff the reason for the buffer zone, the, the creation of buffer zone has multiple advantages. One is it pushes back the distance <clears throat> that a Ukrainian forces, especially drones and 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 flying artillery, have to overcome uh, in order to reach Belgorod and, and other Russian targets. <clears throat> targets especially inside Russia, but also in, in Donbass. Um, so it pushes that back, but it also um, serves or could serve as a negotiating chip, as a, as a bargaining chip, uh, should negotiations occur. Because uh, clearly, Russia holding uh, the military advantage has no incentive to relinquish territory. But what it could relinquish in exchange for security guarantees is part of a buffer zone mm. or shared responsibility for a buffer zone. In other words, the security would not be about the regions of Ukraine that are occupied by Russia. But the security negotiations, the mutual security negotiations, would be over how much additional Ukrainian territory should, will or will not be in a buffer zone. That seems to me perfectly logical and I think would be the strategy to date. Of course, how that uh, unfolds depends on uh, the speed uh, and depth uh, of Russian advances, which could occur in many different areas. It seems to be occurring at a number of points uh, along the front, and now they've opened up, as, I, as everyone is talking about, the northern front, but that's not the end of it. Uh, there, uh, is, uh, more, there are more regions to the west as far as Belarus without even needing to necessarily in, include Belarus, but, but there are further regions of the border that um, you know could be uh, where, where a, a, an offensive could be commenced, which would draw forces away from uh, the defense of the central areas. Yeah, but that's where I wonder. Like, let's say if like if it happened that the Ukrainian <clears throat> army more or less collapses and large parts of it would like withdraw, like orderly or or unorderly. Wouldn't that open another problem for Russia of like what to do with these swaths of land that are now basically would be open? Because uh, do you think they have would yeah. have what it needs in order to occupy this land that would be a strategic liability on them? And buffer zone, yes, but 
Again, well, like, the, the, there's, there's the limits to what they would would be able to do in the West. We don't know what the what Russia's ideal strategic objective is for those areas. Mm. For essentially the area west of the territories it now controls up to the Dnieper River, up, up to Kiev. So we don't know. <clears throat> um, and there are different arguments about that. John Mearsheimer feels it would make sense to put pressure and perhaps to occupy those territories uh, in order to put increasing pressure for a negotiated settlement or a ceasefire with the Ukrainian government. Um, that it would have to be, I think, then a very serious collapse. And even, even in, the, in a serious collapse, of the front lines, a disorganized retreat, uh, there seems to me very little reason for Russia to do anything but surround, not uh, invade and take over any large city, Kharkov, uh, Dnipro, or Odessa. It would, you know, the, the potential for street fighting the high cost of, of, of that and the destruction of the cities, <clears throat> which would presumably, you know, uh, fall to Russia eventually and then be their responsibility to rebuild, all seem to me to be prohibitively high. So I would think that, I'm not a military strategist, but I think uh, Russia will proceed with caution in every area that it advances. The objective being not to gain territory, but to break the morale of the opposing forces. At which point one can decide exactly how far or not one wishes to advance. And then the, the psychological pressure is on the defense to explain itself, explain how the situation uh, for Kiev, I mean, how it's going to get out of this situation and where the defensive line, the new defensive line, is going to be drawn. These are all tremendously, uh, tremendous psychological problems for the Ukrainian government if there is a breakthrough in the lines resulting in the surrounding and surrender or annihilation of large numbers of forces, of Ukrainian forces. 